So like Ashkan said, we're going to be talking about uh, an important discussion on how to strategize for a mass working class party and using the socialist takeover of the Nevada Dem State Party as sort of a case study to do that. Um, okay, so kind of an overview of what we're going to do for our agenda. Um, I'm going to give a quick background on Nevada. Um, Bernie's a uh, little stint in Nevada uh, when he won. I don't know if it's Nevada or Nevada, but I'm going to say Nevada. Um, and then kind of giving a background on the previous Democratic establishment and then giving a, a little overview, overview on what happened, then transitioning into a little bit more theoretical discussions on why even during these events, we need to have extremely firm commitments to socialist values, and especially ones that DSA tries to uphold, um, structural barriers uh, to formulating an independent uh, socialist party, as well as uh, going into a little little bit more into the future and how to organize for the future and giving the distinctions between what a clean break strategy is and what a dirty big dirty break strategy is and sort of advantages and disadvantages to both and what role DSA plays um, in all of that. Um, so yeah, any any good party discussions always begins with Bernie Sanders. Um, so in 2016 and 2020, uh, it really sets the scene for a, a socialist wave to erupt in Nevada as you know our organizer in chief Bernie Sanders creates uh, baseline conditions that energized, you know, a, a giant mass of people, working class people that were ready to engage and organize um, for a socialist cause, for a working class cause. And Las Vegas DSA was on the forefront of having effective ground, like a ground strategy um, in which they had uh, workers and worked with coalitions and uh, unions to ensure that Bernie would win. And, and he, he did, and this is important because it really sets the stage for what happened recently with Nevada. And um, I think this is a unique discussion about Bernie because it sets a very important standard on uh, of what a class struggle politician is, uh, which means that, you know, they have to be organizers first and legislators legislator second. And, uh, you know, this is an important precedent to set when we talk about why we need a dirty break, you know, what that looks like, why class struggle elections play a big role in that, and why none of it matters if, um, we don't have a strong, effective, uh, and large-scale labor movement that centers the working class power. But you know, in any conversations we have about Bernie Sanders, we also have to realize that there are thousands of workers, caucusers, and you know, a bunch of other people that made his victory possible through canvassing and you know, convincing their fellow workers of the need to raise expectations for a dignified life. And and you know, I think uh, so many different groups like unions pulled it, you know, put their support behind Bernie, and he was able to you know, pull out a victory in Nevada. And socialist organizations played a big role in that, like Las Vegas DSA, where you have big tent organizations for the ordinary working class individuals like all of us to help develop critical organizational skills and make, you know, victories like this possible. And all of this transcends Bernie as a movement and continues to grow in Nevada. Um, so a little bit background on the previous political establishment. Uh, this old walking geezer, uh, Harry Reid um, was a Senate Majority Leader between 2007 and 2015, and uh, he was Senator uh, for Nevada between, I think, 87 and 17, and so he's like, he's what we call an established Democrat, you know, someone who makes the wheels turn, who tries to create blue tides, and I mean, so why do we care about this guy? Um, he was the political mastermind behind the Nevada Democratic Party and created a permanent staff for the Dems where there wasn't one, you know, all this sounds fine, but um, you know, he's, you know, he, he, he claims to be a guy that was pro-immigrant and pro-environmental issues, you know, just a good old guy like, like Joe, but that's obviously never the case. And uh, they created what uh, was known as the Reed machine. And they call it the Reed machine because Reed was notorious for fundraising and working very closely with special interest groups um, uh, to raise millions and millions of dollars for, you know, for not just environment and pro-labor issues, but for the purposes of accumulation and maintaining power. And this is what helped establish a strong democratic presence. And it allowed him to roll back on a lot of promises like saying the Green New Deal is not probable, shutting that down and uh, saying increasing tax taxes on the wealthy is just a radical change that won't work. So none of this is new. He's just you know another established geezer and kind of rose to the occasion. So this is the kind of person that we're having to deal with, um, at least in Nevada. So. What happened? Um, a DSA-backed slate 
won all five state uh, party leadership positions. Four of them are due saying DSA members with Judith Whitmer as the uh, state party chair. And you know the response was a rather absurd um, but a predictable measure taken by establishment Democrats. One of the first things that they did was transfer $450,000 of the party's funds to independent accounts of the Democratic uh, Senatorial Campaign Committee. You know, but that wasn't the only thing that they did. Um, there was massive uh, backlash on all fronts. Um, operatives from what became the Reed machine uh, said that all of the fundraising and organizing that the machine has been doing can be accomplished outside of the confines of the Democratic State Party organization, and that there's really no choice but to work around the party now, not that they're socialists in power. Um, so, you know, every single staff member from the State Party, every single one of them quit, and all the consulting contracts were severed. And so the party literally tried to invert itself to prevent a DSA backed le um, leadership from being, you know, behind the levers of the State Party. And none of this should surprise anyone, even. Uh, you know, even the slightest perception that capital or power is being threatened, there's an active effort to crack down on movements and delegitimize power and decision-making capacity of the left. Um, so, you know, to not completely be in power and cede leaderships to socialists means that um, the way they manufacture consent is at risk, the way information is manipulated is threatened, and relationships with labor movements and social organizations is now rearticulated from one of antagonism with the Dems to cooperation, at least now which is something they don't want. And just a little context about Judith Whitmer. Um, she's, this is not the first time she did, she's done this. Uh, Clark County tried similar strategies before um, where there was massive resignations at their executive board. So she's very experienced with how to kind of pull organizations forward and how to grassroots organize and have good uh, small donor fundraising models that Bernie has um, kind of modeled for everyone to you know, adopt. And they were able to able they were able to overcome um, a lot of these hurdles before. So this is something that was very uh, easy for them to step into and not unpredictable. So that's all the background of what what's happened. Now it becomes a, a very important question of how do we move forward. So there's a necessity for strong political vision, and uh, I think this quote by Chris Masano is uh, very relevant because he says that in order to have any sort of democratic path to socialism, we need an election of elected government, um, likely over multiple contested elections, mandated to carry out fundamental transformation of the political economy, coordinated with the movement from below to build new institutions and organizations of popular power in society. And I think it's a good way to frame how uh, DSA should continue to push for a dirty break. Um, so commitment to socialism. Um, so here we have, you know, DSA backed members now in the Nevada uh, State Democratic Party, which is good, but forward strategies is what we should be focusing on now. And I think this is this begins a lot of the conversations where some people might disagree with me here, but I think that's good so we can discuss it later. Um, so how can we prevent this from simply devolving into an attempt to reform uh, the capitalistic Democratic Party, right? How can we prevent this from being another strategy of realignment? And the answer is that we need a fidelity to uh, the long-term vision of socialism, which is, you know, as a, a founder of DSA, Michael um, Harrington puts it, uh, it's running the long distance race to have an independent socialist mass working class party. And the ways in which we do that are always kind of in flux, but it's important to remain close to the uh, foundational values of socialism to prevent the dilution and co-optation of um, our politics. And, you know, one thing that uh, always has to exist uh, is kind of the existence of an intense and sustained mass working class uh, class action, you know, just to avoid the pitfalls of social democracy, which, you know, allow capitalism to exist in the first, first place. And, you know, ever since the 1980s and maybe even a couple um, decades before that, capitalism abstracted socialism from its core labor roots. And that sort of severing of labor from socialism is exactly how capitalism and contemporary electoral politics thrive. So if we're ever to have a shot at building a socialist future, um, I think it requires an understanding that simply getting people into office is not an endpoint. It's not a telos, but it's rather a jumping off point um, and a tool workers need to leverage to assert and defend their power. And that brings me to a very important um, Point that the point of organizations like DSA and every campaign that we engage in 
uh, it must strive to answer uh, uh, and sorry, it must strive to like, kind of grow and expand our power on both the social and political level, which you know culminates into an independent socialist party, right? And only then, with that independent party, can we have an accountability of politicians to their workers' base. So, as long as capital is the cohering force for politics, that sort of accountability is impossible and will never exist. So. That's why people like Greg Abbott can never be held accountable. They can fundamentally get away with doing whatever they want. And so I think if we're talking about uh, the sort of long-term vision of uh, an independent socialist, socialist organizations, it's, it's worth sort of diving into the structural barriers to, do, like to doing so and why it doesn't exist right now. And the first one is obvious, capital, corporations, Wall Street, the financial sector, real estate devs, so on and so forth. Um, have all been contributing the most money to U.S. elections, and I think that makes it difficult for workers to assert themselves because you know the financial interests are always prioritized over material struggles, and it ensures that capitalism's um, most powerful tool, uh, which is capital strikes, will always be present. And so, if corporations don't get what they want, they can just pull investments from local and state economies, which eviscerates the economies and wreaks havoc on on the workers. All of which neither the Dems nor the GOP can afford. So that those sort of structures are, are maintained. So getting rid of that is the most important and not taking contributions from corporations, developing grassroots and small donor fundraising is the beginning of that. And I think Nevada is sort of exemplifying a good job of doing that with Judith at the head of that. Um, and another uh, sort of structural barrier is just having high requirements for the number of votes to get on the ballot. You know. Third, independent third parties can never get on the ballot just because the goalpost always shifts between, you know, what is the uh, threshold for uh, kind of being on the ballot and convincing unions to get on board. Like, believe it or not, that's actually kind of a difficult task. In 2016 election, uh, unions gave $157 million to the Democrats. And, you know, despite all that cash, there's been a decline in the union's ability to assert themselves politically and to push pro-union policies, right? And that's no fault of their own. It's just simply a consequence of Democrats offering symbolic gestures of pro-labor in return for nothing. And, you know, that's why Democrats will cater to companies like Amazon who are in a effort, active effort to destroy union formations in, um, in Alabama right now. Um, so, you know, if you were to have a true legitimate working class party, it requires a shift from the influence of capital um, which is something good to keep in mind. Um, I'm approaching 20 minutes, so I'm gonna try and wrap this up. So organizing for the future, um, I think it's good to discuss certain strategies of what a clean break is, what a dirty break is, and why realignment doesn't necessarily work. Um, and the realignment thing, I think requires some good uh, explanations and examples because it's kind of the strategy that people default to. And also people like Bernie and yeah, AOC have defaulted to. Um, so first and foremost, I think it's important to dispel narratives that suggest we can reform the Democratic Party or try to realign the party uh, that's made of the 1%. And this is where I think a lot of people might have some disagreements, but I'm interested to hear. Um, so this strategy has made some success in the past, and we shouldn't ignore those successes, but the sort of cyclical nature of those issues is proof that it will result in fa failure. And I'll unpack this a little bit. So. Students and civil rights activ activists, you know, sought to make the Democratic Party not a party of white supremacists. That's a very admirable and good goal. And they did that. They passed the Civil Rights Act in 64. They ended Jim Crow era legally. And they worked through some of the most important voting rights bills. Right? All of these are incredible political achievements, and they'll never be cast in the wrong light. But then you have to face the reality that all the white supremacists just shifted parties. And eventually, their same logic sort of started to, started to seep back into um, the Democratic Party uh, and just the fabric of society in general. And so you'll see examples like when Bill Clinton is standing in front of an all black, all black population prison and in front of a white supremacist, white supremacist statue announcing his tough on crime agenda, right? So like my point is not, my point is that this realignment may have some good principles and may achieve some good things, um, but it doesn't contest the underlying powers, uh, power structure of capitalism that allows many of these structures to exist in the first place. So we should abandon those strategies because they're vulnerable from violence just shifting registers, moving from one place to another over time in seamless and insidious manners. Just like kind of the example I gave. Um, a clean break. Um, cl what is a clean break? It's a complete withdrawal and is too vulnerable to all the structural barriers that I mentioned. 
above. And it's usually just kind of an ultra leftist tactic that's unproductive. You know, it has some right ethical ideas, but it always leads to failure. There's just no, it's just resource deprived. And, um, you know, third parties don't really have a, a place in politics right now. And that leads us to uh, a dirty break uh, in class struggle elections, right? Nevada proves that we can use Democrats to strategically use campaigns to heighten class consciousness and encourage labor movements in the working class to rise in the form of strikes and other relevant campaigns that center working class priorities, material and uh, like emotional priorities. And that allows us to sharpen contradictions between the working class and rank and file members of you know, the wealthy Democrats, right? So eventually that agitation will reach a point where we can actually entertain the idea of splitting because the size is so large and the reach of socialism is so large that there's legitimacy in breaking. And so that's the goal. And a lot of this should sound familiar because our grandpa and chief Bernie had very similar strategies of agitation. And there's a lot of examples, um, but just for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip them. We can discuss about them later. Um, so the last, the last thing, where does DSA come into all of this? Um, it is the motor, it can be the motor uh, to forward the dirty break strategy, right? And the big tent nature of the organization means that it doesn't have to quite have all the answers and thought out methods yet, but the political direction of it gets better and better such that it's a step in the right direction. And, you know, Megan Day uh, argues that political education becomes a crucial point of emphasis for DSA to prevent the blurring of lines between socialists and Democrats as the ones that, that's happening in Nevada right now. So I'm just gonna give a quick three reasons of why political education is good and then I'll be done. The first is that it, it elucidates the history of socialist strategies and helps us as organizers have robust analysis on what strategies are good and bad, kind of like what we discussed tonight. Two, it teaches us to be skeptical of politics, political developments in a good sense in that we always ask ourselves the question of how does this forward socialism and, it, and, if, uh, and if such strategies strengthen or weaken DSA's capacity, which is something we should always keep in mind. And three, it cultivates effective democratic deliberation that teaches us to become effective organizers and leaders that enable us to be prepared for a socialist governance. Right? So if we don't have to practice being organizers or leaders, then we can never rise to the occasion. Uh, and um, I think Megan Day does a great job of explaining this and it does require everyone and there's truly no shortcuts to that process. And a lot of the theoretical uh, stuff that I just talked about came from the fourth chapter of Bigger Than Bernie. And I think Megan Day and Micah Utrecht do a phenomenal job in uh, articulating all of it and the histories of it. So uh, 